Hello. Um, let me just get the PowerPoint up. Um, so I'm, I don't know if you've seen the exhibition or you're coming to the opening, but the, the exhibition was an Arts Council funded exhibition, or an Arts Council project grant. The archive invited me to work with them because of my history of, of painting fairground, landscapes and tents. There was a lot of engagement in the project um, with um, Sheldon and Bob Chase and others, which will be on the panel as well. And I think I really focused a lot on engagement as to, to why archives remain active, why they're still a valuable source, why we spend resources on keeping them cool and air conditioned um, and preserving, preserving history and what it means to a contemporary audience and how a contemporary audience engages with it and how you can peel back through the layers of time to find relevant stories um, today. So, and also for the creation of new archive material. So I'm going to do a stunt of talking very quickly <laughs> and loudly because um, a lot of what this presentation is is about giving Sheldon time to talk. Sheldon's a sixth generation showman um, and he has a lot of um, information and com conversation about showman identity and me and Sheldon spoke a lot about landscape uh, for me as a landscape painter. Bob's a photographer who um, took photographs of showmen in the 70s, um, so they're included in the exhibition. So when you get a chance to look at the exhibition, you can you can see their work. But what I'm going to do very quickly is to see how I responded, uh, explain how I responded to engaging with them and their content. I'm going to turn the camera around, so unfortunately, for the viewers at home, they get, just get to see me. Um, so I originally discovered Bob's um, archive right at the beginning of the project. The project started in 2022 in July and I think Bob had only donated his archive, his collection earlier that year um, and it's these collection of photographs from 78-79 at the Kings Lynn Mart which is the earliest um, uh, fair in the season but also an ancient, a really ancient historical fair. Um, when I attended it was the 818th um, fair but it was this particular set of photographs um, when there was very heavy snows, it starts on February the 14th every year on Valentine's Day and that's where, <laughs> whether it's snowing or not. So it's these really interesting monochrome images of showmen working in the snow and these and then these kind of converse images of night time and later on in the season, you know, because Bob photographed at a number of places of the fair at night and the Hannah Howell structures loom out at night and the, the light and it's like a reverse negative really so in this these daytime scenes there's kind of darkness amongst the snow and then light emerging so i kind of developed a real interest in bob's photographs really early on in the project um the archive put me in touch with bob which was brilliant um because then we had conversations and we decided to go back to visit kings lynn um a, to see if we could find any of the showmen in the pictures, to revisit the site. Bob himself is from Kings Lynn, he grew up in Kings Lynn, he saw the fair every year and also has um, showman connections with his, within his family. Um, so the Kings Lynn Corn Exchange really kindly offered us a space to screen the photographs in Bob's collection, which are also in the digital archive, so we had them all digitally scanned by the fairground archive. So we brought, we brought them, we... Um, we attended the week before during the build-up of the fair, that's me handing out nice uh, leaflets, um, promoting the project to showmen. Um, showmen are extraordinarily busy at this time because it's, it's the biggest start to the season. They're really just thinking about income and making the fair work. So it was quite a big ask even to get five minutes to just come in and view these photos. So promoting it beforehand. We had the screening um, and it was really wonderful. There's a picture of me with um, some showmen who A, found themselves in the photograph, their aunties, grandparents, another showman found pictures of his dad who he hadn't seen, his dad had died when he was six and he found photos of his dad he'd never seen. So it was this wonderful idea of a living archive. So when you have an archive and breathe life into it and it becomes active um, and relevant to people living today. So Bob um, set up a QR code, he set up a Google Drive um, which showmen could scan on the day and start adding information. So on the day Bob and I were collecting and Moira, Bob's partner, um, 
and we'd hear names so there's me going rabbit so that was the nickname mm -hmm. of this particular um, worker not a showman showman often hired workers as well to help them can build the fair up but then Jolie Remblance who has added a lot of information to the photographs knew knew his name so this um, new archive this modern digital archive on Google Drive has been updated and continues to update I check on it um, and see what's going on so John Green um, he was someone I found in the archive he saw this little picture of himself and his sister um, he was really excited to see that remembered the day remembered how heavy that um, one arm bandit was um, and really it, nice again that Jolie's come back and remembered it was Alfred Green's arcade so um, this is John today a picture of I took of him he had three two rides at a stall at Kings Lynn Mart um, and what I'm going to do next is I'm going to play a really brief interview with him because I did, during this period, I took, um, I did recorded interviews um, with showmen um, to, to bring into the archive. All of this will be new archival content. Um, but on the next slide, I'm showing a film by Ted Dandridge, which is in the Vic King collection. Vic King is a kind of enthusiast of rides and he collected films made by other amateur filmmakers. And quite interesting because that's my viewpoint in the structures of the fair um, and interesting that they come into colour. Bob will tell you about why he chooses to photograph in black and white when he speaks. Um, so this should work. John Green, uh, I've been on the mark, I would say now, all my life. <laughs> the photographs was very good because it took me back to my childhood. and sometimes you forget a lot of things and also a lot of people and there's photographs there god bless the souls there's a lot of people who's gone and just seeing the photographs reminds you of a good childhood i had at the time showman's history should always be uh, supported and, and looked after because i'm the fourth generation in my family to come to the king's Lynn mart with luck my boy is here as well so he's like the fifth generation and there's not many families or firms what can go down that line in generations. Working today is a lot harder, more stressful, because before it was more like a family, all working together, and now everybody's got their own stresses because the price of everything, and you've got to try and keep everything down so people visit the fair. It's, it's just a, a special way of life. It's very hard for people to get into showmanship because it's the hours is very different to anybody else's. Most people nine till five, and we're, we're sometimes seven o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock in the morning again. You know, you just can't tell. But it is a, a good life. <laughs> um, John Green. John's lovely. I like the way he's jangling coins through the entire interview. He's, he's got his um, penny slots. Um, so then, going back to Bob's photograph, Bob was really interested in the in the people. Um, operating in the fairs and the living wagons and I was really interested in this world within a world a home within another world a transient world in which there's a home and how the living wagons form part of that transient world um, and Bob will tell you more about that but also in the exhibition today I, I was really interested in showing Bob's original photographs that he printed for his exhibition and how they're mounted and linking them with the Sanger family collection and their own pictures of of living wagons and then being mounted. There's a real <coughs> physicality of the archival object that I was interested in. You know, very much when you see Bob's photos, they speak of the 70s on glossy card and rounded corners. Um, and these pictures from the, the Sanger family collection from the 1880s, um, you know, one of the biggest show families, historically biggest show families, and trying to make that link through our, the physicality of the archival object and that connection with that history which still moves um, you know and I trace the Sanger family all through the collection also when I kind of I work with archives I'm always looking for a, kind of these little sprites or shape shifters a kind of repeated motif that appears through the decades and there's a continuity of history through this symbol so again I saw Bob's um, this photo on the left of Bob's of um, the gallopers being taken down and this kind of vulnerability of this um, this horse that usually we're gliding on and it's moving around the circus, moving around the fairground, and then how vulnerable it is being deconstructed. This is another Vic King film, 
um, of some gallopers being removed from storage to go down to the Dingles Fairground Heritage Museum and that kind of <laughs> angry looking galloper. Um, so it's, it's really just the, seeing that motive moving through the archive. Again, um, this postcard I love, which I, I, show, I put in the show of um, the donkey as a, as a weather barometer sent to a, a donkey dealer or, or um, the Dobsons who use donkeys as part of their, um, their fair. And John Sanger, who was from the, the Living Wagon, that history, he was into horse racing, gambling, <laughs> betting, but he had all these beautiful um, diaries where he'd have betting odds, but also um, weather, rain. He noted the weather on every single day through these stacks of diaries. And that's a reminder of how important that is to showmen and how it can make the difference between an income in the fair, setting up the fair, and how important it is to these, to these lives. Um, so this is really just a direct way I work with archives through drawing and this transitional phase that goes through drawing. So this is Bob's um, photograph of Donald Prince, his flying coaster again in these snow pictures and it becomes something completely other you know at the fair it would be bright colors it would be large it would be standing over you um and now it, it looks like this this strange um mythical object in the in the fair in the snow and i i tend to work a lot with shrines in some of my paintings so this is a kind of transitional drawing turning that into something else which i'll talk about later um, and only fair to show Donald Prince whose ride it is, but then you can see the scale of it looming over him. Um, and I love that every ride has a name attached to it, you know, but we'll talk about that with Sheldon. So this is the Kingsley and Mart 2023 when me and Bob went down. This is quickly how I work again with paintings. My paintings are very layered um, and they come from different histories. So I've dealt with the monochrome from Bob's work and photography and the new Tagada ride and this layering of history and considering this layering of history on the site as I say it was the 818th Kings Lynn Mart and that site has been walked upon um, lived upon you know the showmen have been coming there for hundreds and hundreds of years so it's really thinking about both the weight of that history and the lightness of the showman's life because they can be gone the next day. Um, very quickly, Nipper, I keep saying quickly, Nipper Appleton and Lawrence Appleton from Bob's photographs again. I was lucky enough to be hanging around a bar and met Lawrence and Nipper. Um, that's what the Arts Council fund. Um, but no, we really lovely interview with Lawrence. He was the chief operator. He'd just become um, Nipper, the chief operator at um, Kingsley in March 2023. Um, and he has a ghost train. And I traced his ghost train, ghost train through the National Fairground archives. Um, so many different iterations of it, different years. They change every, you know, different seasons to go with culture, what's fashionable. There was a really nice undersea world one I found from the 80s, and I really remember under the sea being very popular at that time. Um, and this is how I work, you know, and using different source material and creating these new spaces. Um, for the rides and for the worlds that I then go on to create in my work. Um, and these are all in the exhibition, so you'll see them. And so finally, this is one of Bob's photos taken at this Kingsley in March 2023. Um, and you can see that although these rides are big, they're hydraulic, they're, you know, a lot easier to install, to build up, but actually there's still these beautiful poses of push-pull and the physicality of it. And that's a father and son. Um, John Birch and Son, and this is John's rides um, that he has. So he has the traditional waltzer, but then this new extreme ride, which was very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm going to do now is quickly put Bob's presentation quickly, quickly, <laughs> um, and I'll let Bob talk to you about his practice, you know, the project that I've referred to. Um, I'm you have got... What, how long, when are we up to our answer? You've got about 20 minutes, because we're a little bit started a bit late anyway. Yeah. Um, Joanna, thank <laughs> you very much. Um, <laughs> Joanna, yeah, um, it, it, you know, the display, we just, I just had a, a few minutes looking up there, and it's my first encounter with, it, with, with the exhibition. You know, it's, it's rich and deep and deserves some time and, and multi-layered. Um, 
uh, and of course, if, if, to say right at the start, that it's you know it's quite a moving day for me. I'm, I'm not a photographer anymore. I was obsessed with photography from when I was about 12 to when I was about 20, 22. Um, and these photographs, um, and for that period, I thought I might have taken some reasonable pictures. I might have <laughs> taken some, <laughs> some good pictures. Um, but they didn't really have a life after, um, uh, uh, after being used in my final exhibition. Um, they literally, and I'll show you, they went into a cardboard box, they went into a suitcase and weren't, uh, weren't seen again for, you know, for 40 years and more. And, um, but to see them now uh, being used, being shown, being appreciated is, is really moving for me, actually. And, and uh, so I feel quite um, honoured uh, about that. So I'm, go I'm going to just show you the, um, this one, right? This one? <laughs> right, this, sorry, this keyboard, <laughs> yeah, exactly. not that keyboard. I, I haven't now set anything. <laughs> I'm going to sort of tell you about this, my component of it, you know, how this came, uh, uh, you know, how these photographs uh, came to be. And there's a little bit of a story there of how, of how this happens. So I, I was taking photographs, as, as Joanna has already mentioned, I grew up in Kings Lynn. Um, family on my father's side, a fisherman, um, and uh, uh, you know, and my, all my family lived in the town. I knew, you know, I used to be taken to the mart when I was, at, you know, early enough to, uh, you know, uh, to walk. Uh, it was a big event for the for the town. You know, I'm not saying that Kingsland is dull, but when the mart came around, it livened the centre of the town up, and, we, and it was fantastic. So it was very memorable as a, you know, as a child. And just to prove it, here's a photograph of, of me in a very uh, un, 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 uh, um, unflattering position, actually, with my the camera I'd saved up for for, for you know for um, for a whole summer working in a camera shop to buy, uh, and uh, my friend Kevin, who was a, my co-conspirator and photographer in in Kings Lynn, uh, took that photograph. So there's me looking moody, a picture a picture uh, taken by Kevin. Uh, as well. So this was just before I went to technical college. I knew at that time I wanted to study photography um, uh, and I'd chosen a course already at Harrow, um, uh, Harrow School of Photography, the art school in, in, in Harrow. And that's where I was going to go and I knew I was going to go there from when I was 14. Did my um, A-levels at uh, the local technical college in Kings Lynn, um, which uh, I, didn't, I didn't excel at. But I did well enough. I managed to convince the people at, at Harrow School of Photography to take me on as photographer, as, as a student there. And uh, so there's me looking, you know, trying to be a cool 1970s photographer. And I got to be, you know, where I wanted to be at the uh, at, at Harrow College. Just a little bit about. I mean, you, uh, uh, during your talk, it made me think that uh, you talked about oh, these photographs and the way they amounted to the light in the 1970s. And I was thinking that's right, isn't it? What were the what were the stunning images around? What was I influenced by in the 1970s? And it was by photographers like these. Um, now, Bill Brand is not a 1970s photographer, but he's somebody's work I knew of at that time. His um, uh, you know, black and white photographs of uh, the aristocracy in London, but also in the north, you know, Grimmett North. Um, these wonderful black and white photographs taken with wide angle uh, plate cameras at, at, at that time. Um, and then Bruce Davidson was uh, an American photographer who was shooting here in the, in the, in the, in the 1960s um, and producing these, what for me were kind of poetic, dramatic, mo you know, monochrome images that, that, had, you know, that had such a lot of power and depth. And I wanted to take photographs like that, essentially, and tried my best to. Um, because I was, th I was living in, I you know, grew up in Norfolk, um, I had connections there. I wanted to take, you know, I wanted to take... Um, photographs of what was happening around me, work that was happening. Um, so here's a couple of pictures, one in the local canning factory, and I actually worked in the canning factory during the summers for, but while I was at photography college to earn enough to buy cameras and films and, and uh, whatever to, to be a photographer. Um, the picture on the right is, uh, I, I have family connections into the fishing uh, business, as I've already said, and this is in the middle of the wash. I went out on you know, fishing boats, taking photographs uh, you know, uh, at that time. So it was this interest in, um, you know, not being a wedding photographer, not being a food photographer, but being inspired by people like, you know, Cartier-Bresson street photography, using small, uh, use, not using flash, using small 35 millimeter cameras. You know, Nikons are available at that time. Some of you may know 
the religious or Catholics, and they, you, know, you may know about uh, the Walsingham Shrine in, in, in <laughs> Norfolk. Um, so I did a project there, um, stayed for several days, visited, and was taking photographs of, of people coming along to that. And so you can see here this using this kind of high contrast black and white taking film that was uh, pushed um, so that I could um, means it was more sensitive to light and I could uh, I could um, uh, take photographs without flash in these circumstances. So what have we got next? Um, another photography that inspired me at that time and there was a collection of, of people but Chris Killip, the a British photographer at that time, was uh, was taking photographs of communities um, you know, we sort of look at the end of the 1970s, the kind of economically quite difficult, there's just pre-Thatcherism uh, that was happening. And it was, you know, a lot of traditional industries around the, uh, the country were getting sort of, uh, you know, crushed and, and uh, it was a difficult time. So he, he I almost took as a, as a manifesto his kind of words about immortalizing people, about celebrating context uh, that people were, um, you know, living and, and, and working in. Um, so, in the 1960s, swinging 60s photographers were with uh, you know, David Bailey's with their models and all the rest of it was happening. But also there was, a, there, was a, there was a politicization going on. I think across the arts at that time, people were, um, were saying, who am I taking photographs for? Where are they being used? For what purpose are they, you know, these photographs um, being used? So the Grunwick strike was on around that, at that time and, and students, uh, photography students like me got involved to support the, 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 the workers at that uh, uh, photographic business who, who were on strike, the Asian young a Asian women who were involved. Um, so I suppose I'm trying to set in for me the context of these photographs. I, was, I, 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 was in, I wanted my photography to be engaged, to be worth something. Um, so I, as I said already, I was already photographing um, showmen. I, I had some contacts into that area. So um, it, there was something that was, for me, visually fascinating, a, a world apart. And, uh, and I chose that area and approached people in the showman skill, people I had contact with, to see if I could um, get a bit of a passport in, you know, rather than walk up to a fear and say, hey, can I come into your living wagon and take pictures? It was to get some legitimacy from the, the showman's guild, from people who would refer me, who would, who would, who would say, yeah, this guy's okay, he's sound, you can trust him and, 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 and take these photographs. So, um, so I did get some support at that, at, you know, at that time. Uh, the bigger idea, just to share with you, was uh, I, I not only wanted to just go in and take photographs like a photojournalist, um, in fact, was somebody from the Gray family in Norwich said, why don't you build a booth and travel with us? Why don't you actually put your photographs, this exhibition, and take it on wheels so that people can you know, come into it. They can see our fear, but they can, then they can come and understand something about us, see something about us. And so I tried to get some money from the Arts Council. They're not interested. I'm 20 years old. They, you know, they don't know who the hell I am, what this is about. It's a crazy idea. Didn't get any money for it. Um, but I built the booth anyway for my final year exhibition. So with the help of my older brother, where actually the idea was to, you know, was to build this booth, and it would be a, a, a small experience of the fairground. You'd, um, you'd, be out, you'd go in through a door, and there would be the bright lights and music of the fairground, and then you would pass through that to, if you like, the kind of, what I saw as a kind of monochrome reality afterwards. Um, and just, to just quickly, these are the, um, some of the color images that I shot, color 35 millimeter film, and I was using, at that time, quite high-tech stuff. It was using multiple projectors um, with a cassette tape that you put in with music. We all had a click track that changed the projectors. So I could create this tunnel with a mirror on one side and a screen on the other with these uh, color photographs fading in and out of each other with a soundtrack of the fairground. So you had this, you know, this feeling of, go, of, you know, of going into the, into the booth. Um, and then out the back, this isn't, this isn't it exactly, this is just a kind of little representation of what I had in mind. It was, it was a, using a lorry tarpaulin, mounting the black and white photographs on a lorry tarpaulin. So it was this, you know, lorries, big wheels, all of that was part of the life of showmen. So the idea was to go into this, uh, this you know, other, this reality, the, 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 um, the world behind the, uh, the, uh, the public facing uh, um, part of the, the fair. Um, so I, that, so I, I did. I put, the, I put together that um, that exhibition, 
and um, it was kind of it was rather frowned upon by the by the lecturers at the time. They were they they wanted to see nice pictures, you know, in a gallery space hung up and lit of you know whatever it was going to be, sort of you know models and fashion and food and all the rest of it. And here was I doing this sort of photography. Um, so their choice of person for who gave out the it wasn't a degree, it was a diploma at that time, but, and was uh, the fifth Earl of Litchfield. Um, and uh, I sort of, it wasn't an accident that I was still dressed like I was painting my Fairground booth. Um, it's, I sort of profoundly disapproved <laughs> of him as a choice uh, to, for, you know, to give away uh, awards. So you can perhaps get a flavour of why I might have felt that from his quote on the right hand side. He was very much from that kind of, I met. He, he, one of his stories during the presentation was how we met David Bailey under the bed of a model. It wasn't that funny, you know, and he were both trying to get off with this particular model. And it was kind of, ugh, it was a bit horrible. Um, bless him, he's gone now. Um, but uh, the photographers and the photography that I was interested in was not about that. It was, it was, it was about getting, um, you know, was was about this, it was was what's going re on really for people in their homes and their places of work and trying to trying to capture that together. As I said, that exhibition finished. The, the photographs went into a box. Um, I tried to get some interest from um, you know to display them in different places and talk back to Sherman School. Things move on. They weren't as exciting in those days. Perhaps the support was thought of as different. It was an opportunity. My life moved on. I, um, after graduating, I was really lucky to, to get a job with a community arts organisation in Kentish Town in London as a, as a young man. We, uh, all of that was thriving around the country in that time, but particularly in London, a sort of alternative media organisations, community dark rooms uh, that was going on. So it, it was moving away from me as the artist, me as the photographer, to how can I help you how can, I, how can I show you how photography works, give you the facilities so that you can create your own materials? And really that was where my life led after that. I became a community arts officer, I, you know, I ran a theatre and an arts centre as an arts administrator, but it was all about um, how can I give you a space, how can I skill you up to be able to say the things you want to say? So I left being a photographer with my, and behind, um, and only could have come back to that a little bit recently. So I was really privileged to be involved with it. There's, there's some snaps there of you know, helping people, the Young Feminist um, you know, magazine, you know, at, you know, at that pr time produced, um, uh, Shocking Pink, uh, it was a fantastic group of young women would come in and use our facilities producing the magazine, people recording their own records, making their own slideshows. Um, and so that was really the career direction that I took uh, after that. Where are we? Um, as I said, it went into that, that suitcase, um, you know, and it's still a bit stuffed with things at the moment, uh, and uh, and has been dragged around with me at all the different places that I've lived uh, that I've lived since, with that, you know a couple of pictures out out of, out of it that um, uh, that I valued and, and perhaps had around the house. Um, and then it was actually in about 2016 that I first contacted the archive here. So. Um, I'd, re I'd just retired from, I was working at the National Autistic Society, I was working on their, uh, as the head of their digital team there, so I'd moved into the internet, into that um, uh, communication medium, if you like, that, that new communication medium. I was always using photography, I'd kind of get the camera out and, oh, all right, I'll take some photographs, and, um, but using it in my work or using it for the organisations I was with, but I, I certainly wasn't a photographer any longer. Um, and eternally grateful, uh, uh, Ratsin and the team here took that information and uh, Andrew who here somewhere did hours of work digitising it all and lo and, and how wonderful to, to have a, a, a Bob Chase archive here of these photographs and this work in, you know, in, this, um, in this archive. And, but the best was yet to come wasn't it? Um, not, long, not long after that as, as Joanna has said I got this email out of the blue that says very flatteringly. Can you see how um, I am? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't pay you for it. Uh, <coughs> I found your photographs. Oh, really? And I quite like them. And I'd like to use them in this project and maybe do paintings from them. So what greater compliment could there be? So 
I said no, of course. <laughs> so, so she took them, and, and what you're going to see today, what you're hearing about today, is a result of um, not all of this. There are many other influences. So this is just one part. My my photograph has just been one part of this. And there, there are many other parts too. So I've got about three or four minutes just to um, show you a few of the photographs. So going back to, to that 1970. Um, period. Um, this is one of the photographs I kept out of the box that I that, that I liked, um, and it's it's an archetypal picture in the sense that there, there are many, and, and, and Joanna has already alluded to this, where you've got the the dynamism of the graphics and the dynamism of the of the in the, of the of the posture of the person, you know, using their muscles to put this architecture together, to put this right together. And over and over again, I would be using, you know, I'd be photographing in an environment where this physicality happened, this building was happening, but with it, it was surrounding was this dynamic imagery as well. And so they, it was a gift to me as a photographer at that time to bring those, those things together. So there are many, photo, there are many photographs um, in the archive that I took, so 700 negatives or something, and many of them, of course, I haven't seen. I, you know, I've made a selection of about 15 or 20 of them, and all the rest of them, I, you know, I never printed. I maybe looked at a contact sheet once, and now, it's like, I've got, oh my God, did I take that? All these pictures I haven't, haven't really seen. Um, but the, but the, so, the, so in the archive, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of those sorts of photographs, or in the in the photographs that I took. But the one is the smaller portion of them. Uh, are ones of people, ones of women particularly, um, that show you know there's something that shows the, the domesticity of it, um, and 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 the family involvement of people. So this is a particular, you know, lovely characters. These the, you know these women who are running the candy floss stores, who are running the small stores, who are taking the money, who are really in, in, you know involved in the business. Portraits of people, Jimmy Bug. You know, um, that quote from Chris Killip, he talks about immortalizing people. You know, it's about, and, and one of the quotes, wasn't it, from the film, was saying, um, was saying, so, uh, bless them, I saw, the, you know, I saw these photographs of these people and that was really valuable. And, and, you know, now it makes me think, well, yes, they are, people do appreciate them. Um, so I, they were, I was very privileged to be given the trust to, in, to come into the home space of, of, of showmen and women to be able to take these sorts of photographs as well. There's sort of intimacy about them and a domesticity about them, an ordinariness in some ways. The one in the other time. You know, family is really important. These are just simple snaps, really, in different different lights. Dad, you know, being so proud of his of his son, I suppose. And also the the other bit of behind the scenes is that what happens in the winter when you know when the shows aren't running, well, the repair the show the the the, um, the the rides have to be repaired, the side shows have to be repainted. So this is the the uh, Gray family up in Norwich at that time. This is their workshop, and very carefully stripping down, repainting, regilding. You know, so it's again an unseen part of what happens. This is Norwich at that time. We, you know, women, sure, I guess water carriers, right? Water cans. Yeah, that's what they do. So you're not a mains, you know, you're not a mains water day if you want some. You know, you've got to carry it where you are. You know, and this is all. It's quite tough, quite hard work. And the, again, the domesticity of it, you know. People are getting their hair done, you know, ready to go for a party or whatever. But they were, they were more difficult to grab. <laughs> this guy, <laughs> I don't remember his name, but um, uh, there were also the, you know, the, the young men and women, mostly young men, of course, who were, who were hired hands onto the, onto the theatre ground itself. So um, there wasn't space in the showman's wagon, nor should there be for me, so I got to be in a sleeping bag in the kip, in the, in the caravan uh, with these guys. Uh, and uh, he was a bit of a scary character. He, I, he came back with a huge Bowie knife one night and when Elvis died and carved and, and wrote this little shrine into the caravan as I was quivering in my sleeping bag underneath as he wielded this huge <laughs> knife. Um, this, uh, this paraffin stoves, 
you know, late at night having a phone. So again, it's, it counts back to that style of photography, that, like that 70s black and white monochrome, you know, that I still love, really. I'm still half of That's the last image I'm going to show. Again, this is one of the pictures that I, I didn't, I couldn't remember I'd ever taken. And when I look back through, look back, to, uh, you know, look back at that, you know, I, I really, I really like. But this is this sort of detail, the grittiness that's there too. So it's the big picture, but also the detail is very important in photographs too. And so I have one minute over. Just to find out, what am I doing now? I'm very lucky to, I've always been involved in boats and canal boats, and now I run a kind of floating art centre. And um, I run a project at the moment with a guy from a project called Bin Pinhole London, and we work with kids um, with a camera obscura, teaching them how to make pinhole cameras. This is a school in Hackney, and they come on the boat, take photographs, develop and print the photographs on, on the boat and we're doing more of that with some schools in Enfield uh, next month. So I've come back to photography, a little bit pinnacle photography, um, all these years later. Thanks for your patience, and uh, I'll hand over to uh, Skip that one. lovely to be viewing as an audience member. Um, so we've got some time for questions, if anyone has any questions for me or Bob. Um, and then there'll be a, a comfort break, um, and then we'll move on to the next talk after that. So I will field your many questions. <laughs> um, I've got one for Bob, actually. It's, um, we were talking about your photography, really, and the way you were actually just the the way of using light and exposure so that you can take photos late at night and you've got those contrasts and, and the light, and that's something I work with in my work as well, are very much about dark and light, even in the daytime. So I don't know, maybe you want to talk a bit about that, you know, just the technical choices, really. Yeah, I mean, it's very much, you know, inspired by some people like like, like Kathy Russell, like, um, like Bill Brown. It was something, I mean, I love the graphics nature of it. You, by not doing colour, and you include colour, but you're very careful with the way you, you include colour and how you, how you work with it. Um, it reduces the amount of information. You know. there, there are some fantastic colour photographers um, that do documentary work, of course there are, that, you know, that do that. But I never really succeeded very well in that. Um, I, I love colour, but there's something about those monochrome images of, of, of that period, and particularly the relatively high contrast. Again, we were stripping, you're suppressing information um, to get bigger images out. And for, it's almost like, I suppose, it's, did Rembrandt do that? I mean, I know it's not Rembrandt lighting, but it's like, <laughs> uh, but it, in okay, any so case, so but you it, it's where from, you're yeah, using you're it where like, people pop, you know, pop out of it much yeah. more, so you yeah. focus on it. Um, and that's interesting. I'm going to put the swap. I'm going to turn the owl on, so we're not just the audience at home aren't just looking at a blank space. Um, but it is interesting because just in the ways I technically make my paintings, because the traditional way is to start with that dark background, and then you add light, you add white, and the figures fall, which is kind of what you're thinking about. But I do it kind of, of course, inversely. So I start with a really bright ground. Like it's an almost neon, and that's funny doing fairgrounds because you're you're bringing that neon to the front, and the neon comes. So it's almost that that underlights the whole painting. So it's a really funny approach. It's kind of like an opposite way to light, but we're both talking about light, and so I find that quite interesting. Um. Uh, yeah, technically at that time, you you, you I mean you could have tried using it with flash, but but there was an, a, a developer that you that was made in America that you you couldn't you could buy here, but it wasn't made in the UK. So you took it was 400 ASA film, um, and if you developed in this stuff called Acutol, it, it, it you had you could expose it. So it gave it two more stops: 400, 800, 1600 ASA. So for those that are technical, that means it's <laughs> so the. Um, uh, so the, uh, so it was it's a, the developers able to bring out a much more uh, uh, fine latent image, 
but what it does is create larger silver halide crystals. So usually lower, you know, you get very fine grain film with very little grain in it. That will be a low ASA. So what you get.